announcement, and if you are on the trustees committee, there will be a very brief meeting after the service today, up front here with Emmy Alma, who will be up front. I have no other announcements unless there is somebody that has something they want to add. No? Well, let's prepare our hearts for, for worship. Thank you.
also uh, on our hearts. Let us pray. Loving God, we come to you first with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for your love for us and that you have led us to love you, to know you, to believe. We ask that you would hear us as we lift to you privately the thanksgiving of our hearts. Let us pray. Places 
uh, that we might be differently, that love might look differently, and also those places to which you would have us respond, the needs of our world, whether it's from natural disaster or from impending war or, or just uh, the joy of watching athletes at their best. Help us to support and to acknowledge your presence in every place. Those places that we know are not as you would create them to be. We ask that you would help us to see right where every ache and pain is, right where every illness is, to see love there, to see your presence as it's meant to be. We ask that you would be with every leader, with every uh, leader in our government, in business, in education, in the church. We ask that you would guide and direct. May every heart have a listening ear to your guidance, that we might find that out of this chaos would be a created new level of love and peace, of joy and patience, your presence wherever we might look. We ask that you would be with us in our local uh, communities as wherever we might be worshiping today, that we lift up those concerns of our, our, our local areas. And in our case, the, the names that are on our list, the names that are on our hearts, the names that are in the, the extended family, wherever they might be, whether still on this earth or already with you, hear us as we intercede uh, ask you to intercede on our behalf and then to come to those realms of the physicality uh, that you will not, uh, in which you will not interfere if without invitation. We invite you to be with us and to help these names and situations we lift to you privately now. Let us pray. where we can belong together and where we can learn how to behave 
Sometimes we learn how to behave in church, uh, not particularly sitting in the pew and being corrected, but Jesus tells us to love each other and to love God. Let's pray. Loving God, we are so grateful to be able to, to participate in worship together, to participate in something bigger than we are with all those who are also wanting to join in that activity. We ask your help for all of us, but each of us individually, and may you bless these uh, Cadence and Sullivan's visits with their grandparents today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may go back to your seat. Let's continue our worship as we bring God's tithes and our offerings. Come on up, gentlemen. Loving God, we ask that you would bless every gift as it is multiplied for your kingdom right here at Inman United Methodist Church and beyond. In Jesus' name, amen.
from 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, beginning with the verses after last week's scripture, verses 12 to 20. All right. So if the message that is preached says that Christ has been raised from the dead, then how can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ hasn't been raised either. If Christ hasn't been raised, then our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. We are found to be false witnesses about God because we testified against God that he raised Christ. When we didn't raise, when he didn't raise him, if it's the case that the dead aren't raised. If the dead aren't raised, then Christ hasn't been raised either. If Christ hasn't been raised, then your faith is worthless, and you still and are still in your sins. And what's more, those who have died in Christ are gone forever. If we have a hope in Christ only in this life, then we deserve to be pitied more than anyone else. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He's the first crop of the harvest of those who have died. You have heard the letter of our faith to the Corinthians. Thanks be to God. There is a common question that I hear among the congregations that I serve. It is a question that some, wherever they go to church, seem to be asking. How can we come back to life after this pandemic? How can we fill the pews again with those who used to be involved in church? How can we reach more young people so that our church can grow? There's a sense that our worlds need to take care of to keep ourselves and others from becoming infected with COVID has so dampened our church's motivation, momentum, that we don't know how it can be resurrected. 
Those are the burning questions in our churches today. And while some feel that being able to worship virtually from home keeps people from coming to church, others have seen the numbers and the clear evidence that there are more worshiping with us than before the pandemic because they are able to participate online. My pastor friend, Ron Towery, shared this with me before the pandemic about why people come to church. There are three reasons people come to church. Things are different now than when we grew up. So let's look first at why we first came to church, those of us in that baby boomer generation, perhaps. We came because we believed something. Many of us grew up in families that, they, that believed, and they taught us to believe. If your life is like mine, then church was something we just did on Sunday. Every Sunday. My earliest friends were made at church before I was old enough to go to school. We believed what we were taught about Jesus, and we did our very best to understand it and to live by it. My brother remembers a Sunday school teacher who told him, Jesus just wants to be your friend. And so coming to church as a child has changed his life and still is the context of his faith, being Jesus' friend, having Jesus as a friend. So we might first come to church because we believe. The second reason people come to church is to help them adjust their behavior. Do you remember the world in which we grew up? There were very few self-help books. If we wanted to be better people, then we came to church to learn what that looked like. We came to church to get the support that we needed to make the changes that helped us be better people. So when someone figured out that the way that they had done things had gotten them into a mess, he or she would seek out the help that was available almost exclusively in church. The third reason we came to church is because that is where we knew we belonged. We didn't just belong in church as opposed to other places. We had a feeling of community and belonging at church. Mm -hmm. Church was the place where everybody knew our name. So the order of those reasons, why those of us mostly in that baby boomer generation, born from 1946 to 1964, the reasons we came to church were these. We came to church because we believed. We learned in church how to behave, and we developed that feeling of belonging right there in that community of faith. And that was the way it was then. That was then and this is now. Things have changed, Ron shared with me. Many of the people we want to reach out to to share our Lord with have not had our experience. That why we came to church pattern is now reversed. If others want to come to church at all, it is because they want to feel that they belong to something. Their human need, our human need, is to belong. So when we can embrace others so that they feel they are safe here in church and that they belong with us, only then can we begin to worship and in Sunday school teach anyone what it looks like for followers of Christ to behave. We know how to behave, we who grew up in the church, only because we have been blessed to hear Jesus' words all our lives. Once we long, then they might learn, start from scratch, most of them, they might learn how followers of Christ behave in loving ways. Not just to behave in church with our sitting and our standing and our singing and our offering and all that we do here that is extremely foreign to anyone who has never been to church. But more importantly, those who have been embraced 
by this family of God as those who belong can then hear how to behave out there in the world in a different way. Behave in a loving way that Christ teaches because Christ knows what behaviors bless us and what behaviors are harmful to us over time. So our job here is to embrace others in a way that they feel welcome, no matter their behavior. We want first to share with them our knowing that God's house is a place where all belong. In this modern world, it is only when one feels welcome enough to belong that they can learn how to adjust the behavior. It's only then that Christ can reveal Christ himself to them. And then belief follows. So the order is reversed. They feel a belonging. They see how others behave and hear in church how we might behave in the world. And then Christ can make Christ's self known. God can make God's self known to them. And belief can follow. It does sound backward to us, but we can see that the way we used to attract new members uh, is no longer at work. We used to just have more children who had more children. And because they learned to believe in God at home from others who believed in God, church just followed. The truth is we baby, baby boomers and those who lived before us we never had to evangelize. Our families just got bigger and the church memberships grew. All that stopped in the 1950s with birth control, with the availability of education, and with education, the search for a job outside one's own hometown, usually. Now most children grow up and move away. We are blessed to have the young adults here that we do. They are a part of the old pattern. They grew up in homes that believed and learned how followers of Jesus behaved, and they lived into that and know this church as a place of belonging. The burning question of our day, how can we resurrect what seems to be dying? That question may be answered through our virtual worship or the hybrid of in-person and virtual worship through our doing whatever we can to bring others to know that they belong in the family of God. The real question local congregations might focus on is this, how can we help others feel that they belong right here with us? The burning question in Corinth seems to have been, did Jesus really resurrect from the dead? Paul answered this question by listing all those who had seen the risen Lord, who had spoken with him and had eaten with him after his being raised. Paul shares that he was visited by the resurrected Jesus on the road to Damascus. Paul clearly says that our faith in Christ is useless if Jesus did not rise from the dead. He was the first of us who was raised. Jesus has opened the door for all of us to continue living after we vacate these earthly bodies. I will tell you something. In my early years at hospice, the first two or three stories I heard from those that had visits from their deceased relatives, I listened to those stories, but I entertained that thought, isn't that interesting how the brain compensates for our loss by giving us these delusions? But now, after hearing hundreds and hundreds of these stories and seeing the change the peace that will not let go of those who have had those experiences, I have a knowing that these visitations are evidence of life after death or of the eternal life that we are promised. 
I love hearing those stories, and I'm hungry to hear more of them if you have had that experience. One of my teachers says about dying, if I were to die in this moment, what you would see slumped before you is the afterglow of who I've been. I would find myself floating or rising above you with my hands clearly in evidence in a body that continues to embody me. You would not see me, but I would see you and be able to see your movements and hear your conversations. I would be overcome with peace. And while compassionate, I would not be feeling lost, for I would not have been separated from those that I love. Another teacher of the New Testament says this about Jesus' resurrection. No creature of this universe had anything to do with the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. On Friday, he laid down his life as a mortal of the realm. On Sunday morning, he took it up again. All this power which is inherent in Jesus, the, endower, the one who endows us with life, and which enabled him to rise from the dead, is the very gift of eternal life which he bestows upon kingdom believers and which even now makes certain their resurrection from the bonds of natural death. We Christians believe in the resurrection of Jesus based on the empty tomb. Some speculate that the truth is that Jesus came forth from the grave in a higher form. That would make sense of the reports that those who had known him well did not recognize that higher form in which he resurrected. Imagine that those in spirit, those like the arch, arch, Archangel Gabriel, other angels who also worshipped our Lord and had watched his life on earth, could not bear to see the vessel, the physical remains of that precious life couldn't stand to see it decay over time. Imagine that they asked to dispose of those remains with reverence and dignity. It would have been the angels then that moved the stones and were seen at the tomb, as reported in the Gospels. The true evidences of the resurrection of Jesus are spiritual in nature. There were witnesses who testified that they met, recognized, and communed with the resurrected master. He became a part of the personal experience of almost 1,000 beings before he finally took leave of this earth. And the risen Jesus has become a part of our personal experience. I don't have a struggle believing the resurrection. I suspect that life in and with the Spirit may be vibrating at a frequency we just cannot see with our body's eyes. If the kingdom of God is at hand, then we may be living smack dab in the middle of the kingdom of heaven, surrounded by the saints who have gone before us. They are in a new form that our eyes, body's eyes, cannot see. The resurrection and the life Jesus lives with us still through the Holy Spirit. That resurrection is central to our Christian faith. I've heard some say that they can't wait to leave this life and be with Jesus. Or they can't wait to leave and be with their departed loved ones. Let's not be impatient to get through this life or aim to move to the next life before our time. The divine invites us to see clearly that living a life in the flesh is to be cherished. Jesus' incarnation in human form makes sacred our lives on earth. Every breath is a gift. Every landscape and vista has within it the Creator's love and presence. This environment, our earth, is created for us and placed 
into our hands. Let's honor the earth and all that is in it. Let's look for the presence of God right where we are. Let's look for the presence of God in every other person and in every other situation. Our God honors this life and invites us to honor it as well. Hear the Christian invitation. It is in this life that we are invited into the opportunity to let our free will be used to choose spirit. We're invited to submit ourselves to the will of God for our lives. It is in this life that we are invited to choose to see that we do belong. We belong in the kingdom of God. We belong to the family of God. We're invited to experience that we are all one with God and one with one another. We are each an irreplaceable part of the body of Christ. We're invited to behave in the same loving way that Jesus taught disciples to behave, that we continue to be taught to behave as disciples of Jesus. We are invited to live into our belief in all that is holy. It is our belief that keeps that spiritual door open to the Father's love, to God's love pouring to us and becoming our love, God's love becoming our joy, our peace, our patience. Our believing is the very best Valentine we could ever be offered. Let's receive all that love is offering to us fully in this life and then right into the next. Let us pray. Loving God, we would hear your voice speaking to us, that still, small voice speaking words to us of guidance. May we continue the conversation until we can recognize what voice is your voice and what voices are all those other things that the world would speak to us. May we recognize so that we might follow and be at peace. No matter what the world throws at us, we might be at peace and remain at peace as we walk in the midst of the earth, but also in the midst of the kingdom of heaven. It is in Jesus' name we pray, in Jesus' nature we pray, and in the will of the Father that we pray. Amen. If you will get your bulletin, our statement of faith is written there. Please stand and let us say together what we believe. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who works in others and us through spirit. We follow in the ways of Jesus, celebrating God's presence, living with respect in creation, loving and serving others, seeking justice and resisting injustice, and seeking out hope and peace. We believe every person, regardless of color, religion, creed, age, class, or orientation, is a child of God. We are connected because we are family. We gather because we all have something to share. We encourage one another and hold each other accountable. But most of all, we love one another. Well, thanks be to God. Amen. Join me in the first four uh, verses of uh, number 383. <laughs>
this is a day of new beginnings. Let's go from this place listening uh, for the belonging that we're already a part of as a part of the family of God in Jesus' name. And if you will, just look at, at the end of your bulletin for our choral benediction. Thank you. 